what is up everybody man appreciate y'all tuning in i know there's a lot to talk about i wasn't able to come live after the game like i wanted had to get on the road i had a my mom's birthday was yesterday had to get back here wanted to get back for the fbs national championships i was traveling right after the game made a quick stop yesterday night i was a little bit busy with certain things i had to do but i am back we have to talk about the fcs national championship we got to talk about north carolina a t finally making in my opinion the right hire i put a poll in the chat for you guys to vote how you feel about a t's new head coach vincent vincent brown from william and mary i'm very interested to see how you guys feel about this it feels like a t fans based on the spaces i heard put on my, by my guy dave it seemed like AT fans were really excited about the hire. I'm also going to go through their, their initial CAA schedule, kind of break down what the path looks like for them to, to potentially compete in the CAA. We're going to talk a little bit about the transfer portal, the SWAC teams, and everyone really across the FCS has been going crazy at the transfer portal. Grambling State gets a much-needed OC hire, and I feel like they nailed it. I'm going to break down why I really do feel like Grambling State made the correct offensive coordinator hire. And, of course, we got to talk just the the pure madness of what Campbell is doing on the recruiting trail. Once again, they're up to 11 Power 5 transfers, and they landed two big-time FCS transfers, including a guy from South Dakota State at wide receiver to replace some of the losses they had on the offensive side of the football. Campbell is making waves again, and we're going to have to talk about it. Before we get into just the X's and O's of the game, man, Um Upcoming interviews. Now, my interview with Coach Hampton, UAPB's new head coach, was pushed back. He had something come up in terms of responsibilities that he had to do now that he's the new head coach. So that interview is coming. I just don't know when it's going to be. I talked with head coach Pete Shinnick, uh, Townsend's head coach, today. That interview will be available tomorrow. He was off on the road recruiting, so it's a phone interview. So it'll be a little bit different. Um, be available on podcast and on YouTube. And on top of that, we'll have a feature article on the website as well i am going to have head coach vincent brown north carolina ant's new head coach on the show later this week we're scheduled to interview thursday afternoon that interview will most likely be out on friday and then next week i will have head coach clint killu on the show incarnate words new head coach i got to speak to a lot of the incarnate word people at the fcs award ceremony in frisco a great team of, of people over there, and I'm really looking forward to hearing the future of Incarnate Word, and we're going to talk about their new quarterback today. He's a name a lot of you guys know from the SEC. It looks like Incarnate Word is here to stay. Clint Killew is absolutely recruiting his just at a high level, and Incarnate Word looks like they are bound to potentially repeat in the Southland. Now, the FCS National Championship, man, I'm – I'll start out with, you know, just my weekend and, and the the entire experience. Man, I had an absolute blast in Frisco. I got down there. I know a lot of the people who follow FCS football know about the FCS Fan Nation guys. A gr amazing group of guys, man. I mean, I can't even go through all the names, but everyone I met from FCS Fan Nation, all of them were amazing, especially my guy, the Rev, with his bunny suit that he wore to the game. Just an absolute animal for that it was on tv multiple times after storm the field in the bunny suit those guys were amazing man we went out and, and got some drinks uh, on what was it saturday night and got to meet catch up with sam herder meet him as well man shout out to sam also my guys at fcs uh Trimvariate poll as well both of those guys were instrumental in me getting on the field on on sunday for the game so shout out to both of those guys over there too it, it was it was fun man frisco as much as i wish the the stadium location would change. The city of the city of Frisco is on point, man. There's so many things to do, so much fun. And I think the FCS fans, especially North Dakota State fans, because they all own real estate there by now. It they know they know what to do. And also the award ceremony was great. Got to see Lindsey Scott win the Walter Payton. If you haven't already seen that announcement, Zeke Vandenberg from Illinois State was announced a Butt Buchanan Award winner. And they gave and they awarded Giovanni McCoy the Jerry Rice Award. If you haven't seen my interview with him from the FCS Championship game, you can go check that out. And we also have an article on the website kind of recapping his year and how spectacular Giovanni McCoy was for Idaho this season. But, man, we got to get into this game. And I, 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 a lot of people were picking South Dakota State, but I don't think, I don't think many people thought it was going to go down 
like it did. And shout out to Matthew, man, in the chat. Appreciate you tuning in, man. I don't think a lot of people saw this going how it did in terms of a blowout. I mean, South Dakota State came out here, and I think they wanted to make a statement. They came out. They dominated both lines of scrimmage. They established a rushing attack. Mark, Gr Mark Gronowski had a hell of a game at quarterback, was efficient, threw three touchdowns, and was, was just able to pretty much pick apart the North Dakota State defense based off what they were able to do on the ground with the run game. And for North Dakota State... There's so many things you can look at in terms of how this year's team was was made up that they're going to have to fix if they're going to rebound and win another national championship. I, I've, I've been vocal this year that I felt like North Dakota State wasn't as strong as they historically are. They had a lot of holes. They had they, they, they also faced a lot of injury issues. The transfer portal took some key contributors away mid-year, and it was just – this everything that could go wrong for North Dakota State this year did. And I also think, like I talked about on the preview, I feel like South Dakota State constructed their team for this moment. And I think it paid off on the biggest stage. When you look at their ability to run the football, uh, Amir Johnson, Isaiah Davis, they were absolutely electric. Johnson, 126, a touchdown, averaged 14 yards per carry, had some absolutely explosive runs to set up what South Dakota State ultimately did through the air. Isaiah Davis, 103, a touchdown, averaged about five yards per carry. They were just able to dominate the line of scrimmage. They, at the end of the day, that's what they were able to do is just push North Dakota State around. As much as Spencer Wages, an, an absolute stud on the edge, I really felt like, North Dakota State matched up terribly in terms of the interior defensive line against what the offensive line of South Dakota State wanted to do. They were not able to get any sort of push up the middle. And Wagey's specialty is pass rushing. And I really and I, I really think they took that away from him. He couldn't get up field because if he over pursued, they were able to hit that hit that backside gap and they were able to create an explosive run with Johnson and Davis doing what they did. It was just they were able to take advantage of everything. Also, the Yankee brothers are just those are just those guys. Eight combined catches, 121 yards, two touchdowns, both from Jackson. And that final catch, that over the shoulder in coverage on on the sideline catch to pretty much put this game completely away. It was the last touchdown of the game. What a hell of a catch and what a hell of a throw by, by Gronowski. It it was perfect ball placement. And the DB just didn't have any chance to make a play on it. And so you have to give them a lot of credit. Jason Freeman had a big game. I had, had a big interception, 10 plus tackles. Isaiah Stalbert also had a big game. But I, I'd be remiss. They did not load the box score. And I told you guys they were not. But Reese Winkleman, Caleb Sanders, that defensive line was dominant again. They played in North Dakota State's backfield. They got Cam Miller off his spot. They were able to generate pressure. They were able to cause running backs to hesitate and allow – and they ate up space and allowed the linebackers to go hunt, which is what you want your linebackers to be able to do is have space to be able to come untouched and go hunt the running back or, or go hunt the quarterback. And, and that is what Reese Winkleman and Caleb Sanders do so well. And if you really don't watch what's happening at the line of scrimmage, you would think they didn't make an impact. Each of them had four tackles. Winkleman had a tackle for loss and a sack. But outside of that, they don't load the, the box score. What they do is create those opportunities for Jason Freeman to have 10 tackles, Isaiah Stahlberg to have seven, Adam Bach have six. That Those, those are extensions of what Reese Winkleman and Caleb Sanders create up front for South Dakota State. Deshaun Gales with a big crucial pick at the end of the game, too, was crucial. South Dakota State, I said before the game, this was the team that had to win the national championship. They were built perfectly to beat North Dakota State. There was no doubt in their mind that they could compete and win this game. And, and if they didn't win it with this team, man, it was looking forward, it was going to be hard to foresee them make another run here. They've had the experience, and South Dakota State took full advantage of it. And I'm, I'm really, really happy the Jacks got their first national title. Now, on the flip side, when you look at North Dakota State moving forward, you hear a narrative about this the dynasty potentially being over. And I think that might be a little bit jumping the gun, in my opinion, because they've lost they've, they've lost earlier in rounds before and, and twice with the James Madison gear, the Sam Houston gear, where, the, where they got beat. It is their first national championship loss, I'll give you that. But I would say for the dynasty to officially be over, 
someone someone has to keep them from going next year too and moving forward you, like this this can't be a skip one year and they win five in a row that i don't think that means the dynasty is over what's happened now is now i think you have a chance for this to be a rematch next season when you're looking across the different rosters for the fcs a way too early look it's going to be really hard for me to find somebody who i think potentially could knock either of these teams off in the playoff if they reload properly, I mean, they're bringing up, they're bringing back a lot of talent on both sides of the, all the ball. They have two of the best coaches in FCS and they're consistently in this position. I would, I would be very surprised if these two teams were not back in this exact same position because South Dakota state do what North Dakota state has done and continue the dominance. That's the major question for me. But when you look at North Dakota state, you're going to have to, I, I love Cam Miller. I do think he's a gamer, and I think you saw in his post-game press conference that this season really motivated him moving forward. But in my opinion, I still think you have to upgrade the quarterback spot. I, he 260, two touchdowns, two crucial picks. I, I don't know. I To me, I feel like you need a little bit more through the air. Like I don't think Miller – it's a, right now is enough to get North Dakota State over the hump. We'll see what happens next year, but in my personal opinion, I do think a, an upgrade at the quarterback spot is needed. It it could come in the form of, of Peyton, who's the backup quarterback who saw limited action this year. That could be the future, and a lot of North Dakota State fans feel like he is the future. But that has to be a decision made by head coach Entz on what he's going to do at the quarterback spot. The one for twelve performances against Incarnate Word, the two turnovers, the the offensive inconsistencies that they that they've had at times this year, man, that that ha- that can't happen. And you go win national championships. Also, what what's next at the running back spot? They, they've always been able to suit up and reload, but they're losing a lot at the quarterbacks at, at the running back spot. Who's going to replace Lippy? Who's going to who's going to come in and replace some of that depth in there? They lost Dominic Ganella to the transfer portal. Who's next up? TK Marshall is coming back. He saw some solid time, but he never was the featured guy for them. But the biggest thing for me, the biggest key for North Dakota State is they have to upgrade at wide receiver. After the after Christian Watson left for the draft, after Zach Mathis decided to announce his transfer midseason, or not Zach Mathis, after uh Phoenix Sproles. Zach Mathis was all that was left. They didn't have anybody else really that could just go make his own play. Zach Mathis, seven catches, 123, had seven of the 18 catches and 123 of the 240 passing yards that North Dakota State had in this game. He was 6'6". He's a baller. But when you compare when you go up against tough defenses like South Dakota State, you have, you have to go. They sign it, boo. They don't have to. They don't. They don't have to upgrade their offense. Their offensive lines there. I think they got enough offensive line. Their secondary is fine. I, I, their linebackers are, are are fine in my opinion. I think they also got a beef up interior, and that's just mostly getting healthy for North Dakota State. They were missing a lot on the interior in terms of their defensive line, and it showed down the stretch. So. But for South Dakota State, man, congratulations to them. They definitely deserve it. They they played a hell of a game. And I was I was there on the field and you felt the energy from that fan base too. That South Dakota State side was packed. They showed up, they traveled well, and and they were so excited to win that national championship. I was in the fray. That's how I got some of these pictures. I was there when they stormed the field for the trophy presentation. And the emotion that you like saw from some of the fans was just you could tell this is a long time coming, and, and I think you could tell that, that they felt like this team could be special, and they were able to deliver. Um, they were able to, to to deliver on what they, they should have, which, which was a national championship, man. So congratulations to South Dakota State. Had an absolute blast in Frisco. But the Jacks get the big national championship win, 45-21 over North Dakota State. Moving, moving along, man. North Carolina a and Gets a new head coach, man. Vincent Brown, I've already kind of went through on the show about what his history is, but he's spent a lot, he's been a long time under Mike London, kind of being his number one assistant on the side of from Howard to William and Mary, going back to Richmond, was an FCS national champion, has swag ties, is really tied into what the HBCU culture is in terms of college athletics. I think they nailed this hire. I think. 
He's he's shown he can recruit, he can develop talent. I think he's going to be able to put together a really solid staff with his longtime connections throughout the NFL, throughout multiple stops at the P- Power Five level, the Group of Five level, and throughout the FCS. I'm v- I'm really really interested to see what Vincent Brown's staff is going to look like, and when when you look at his. If you haven't seen it, North Carolina, he already had his opening press conference yesterday, if I'm not mistaken. But he said that he's he's not looking to rush it, but he really wants to get a staff sooner rather than later. So I really do think you're going to start hearing some names leak out in terms of North Carolina A&T, who's going to come in and 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 be the the I, I would say be the groundwork of what he's trying to build here. Offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator is important, but listen, everyone knows who watches college, college athletics. The positional coaches are your main recruiters and the really the, the lifeline to your program. I'm extremely excited to see, does he dip into the William and Mary staff? Does he go back to some guys he coached with at Howard? Does it, does he pull some people from the NFL that he may have connections with? I'm very interested to see, cause he has a lot of different avenues. He can pull people. Where does he look t- to first? Where does he feel most com- comfortable pulling guys from and who does he trust to be on his staff? I'm also, ex- I'm also interested to see one, how he replaces a lot of the players that they're missing. Jacob Roberts, tooting it running back they lost a lot of talent to the transfer portal after sam washington was fired he he talked about that he's been evaluating players he's always recruiting he he knows the kids who already signed in the early signing period and once he gets the staff together he's going to go out and find the pieces that he needs to fill in the holes of where those players left i think linebacker i still think secondary can be a little bit revamped luckily He's a defensive guy. I don't think they're going to have any problem with that. And then also, they do have some. They do have some quarterbacks on the roster that I think can play. And so, does he trust them in terms of quarterback play, or is he going to bring in an OC who potentially could bring whoever his quarterback is at, at that current location with him? That's going to be a big question. And I'm just interested. I, I want to know. I don't know if any A and T fans are in here. I know there's a lot of shows going on. What it was? What's the expectations? And I asked a few people this in the in the North Carolina A&T spaces I was in. What is the expectation like? What is a satisfactory performance year one of the CAA for a first year head coach of Vincent Brown who is coming in one after the early signing period and two having a lot of holes to fill in the roster? Is this first year kind of a a throwaway year where you kind of give them a break as long as, you know, we don't absolutely go winless or or one or two wins. Like if we get to four plus wins, that's, that's great. I don't know. But for me, looking at the schedule, I got a, the CAA released their new schedule. This is A&T schedule. He opened up against UAB. They played North Carolina Central week two. Then they have Elon, Norfolk State, Villanova, Delaware, Richmond, Hampton, Townsend, Rhode Island and Campbell. This is the schedule for AT. Now they avoid William and Mary, which is huge. But they do have some tough games, man. The Delaware, Richmond, Villanova stretch is going to be tough. And then even the last two games with, with Campbell and Rhode Island, especially with the way Campbell's been recruiting, I don't think those are give me games either. And the first three, to me, it's going to be imperative, in my opinion. I know they I know they did it this year, and they they overcame it and competed for a conference title, but that was the big sell. Going 0-3 to start the year is almost – I feel like that's a – I really do feel like that's a death wish for a t this year. You cannot start 0-3 to the season and potentially be – because I think they'll beat Norfolk State, with especially with how that roster is constructed right now. They're a better team than Norfolk, in my opinion, as of January 10th. 1-3 – Going into CAA play, man, that that's going to be that's going to be brutal. That that that's going to be absolutely brutal. I uh, because UAB to me is a loss. Right now, I would lean Central just because of the consistency. Everything Central's returning. It should still be a close game because it's a rivalry game. But I'm still leaning Central, and Elon's going to be a tough game too. Elon was a playoff team this year. He compete and beat some really good CAA teams 
last year. I mean, that they went in there and beat Delaware. I was there. They they dominated Delaware. That's not going to be a gimme game. So you have three games that are one is pretty much a loss in UAB. And then you got two really, really competitive games for you get into Norfolk. And I believe that Norfolk game's on the road. So that that's still not necessarily a gimme game. And you got to go on the road to face Delaware. You got Rhode Island on the road. It's just, it's it's going to be a tough stretch. So I really do think when I'm looking at it, if you can get to five wins for A and T, that's a solid year one for Vincent Brown and A and T first year in the CAA. And I know that sounds like a an average year to most people, just five wins. But if if you can if you can get Norfolk State, Hampton, Townsend, Campbell. And then find a win somewhere else in terms of five wins. I think that's a solid year one for Vincent Brown, especially with with how good because Villanova has been a historically uh, has has been a playoff team. Delaware was in the playoffs this year. Richmond took Sac State all to the brink this year in the playoffs. Rhode Island was was on the bubble for the playoffs. Campbell and AT had a hell of a game, and Campbell's been recruiting at the highest level. Elon was in the playoffs. You have the Celebration Bowl champs in North Carolina Central. And you have a and you have a group of five UAB team that's at the upper echelon of the group of five who went in against Alabama AM and was kneeling at the two yard line in like the early fourth quarter. So you you have some really, really tough tests. And I think you're gonna find out extremely early what North Carolina a and is as a team, because I think we're going to know by week four what kind of team they have. And luckily, they do get a bye week after those first three games, but it's still, I to me, you, 0-3 would be really pushing it for me. But I think 5-6 wins is, is there, but you're going to have, but anything less, I think Vincent Brown is going to have to really answer for in, in terms of the expectations, because I think what, the a t fans are going through based on what I've been hearing, and I, I don't blame them, is you had a coach who reeled off a long streak of wins, was one game away from winning the Big South this year, potentially going to the playoffs. He's been a historically successful coach in your program, and you fire him, you know, I, from the outside, it looks like you didn't trust him to win in the CAA. If you go out and hire a guy, all this experience, I think the resume is there for – for, for for Vincent Brown, the resume is there, but if he goes out and struggles mightily year one and two, a lot of the fans, a lot of the boosters, a lot of the alumni are going to be looking around like, why did why didn't we give Sam Washington an opportunity? That's, and I think that's a valid question. I really do. I I, I think that is an extremely valid question for A and T fans. So this is the schedule, man. I think I can see five six wins, top notch. Anything less, man, I, it, it'll be tough moving forward. But I think they got a good group of conference games. They get to test themselves against some of the top teams, but they do have Hampton, Townsend, Campbell. They got some winnable conference games as well. I think Elon's a winnable game. It'll be a tough winnable game. That's probably one of those 50-50 conference games. But I think they got a, a, a pretty favorable schedule because it could have been uh, it, it could have been rough if, if a few games are switched around. So let's see. Said Sonic says sometimes you have to make a change to get over the hump. That's fair. And cats uh, was bigger dreams than most. That's why they made the hire. V said Sam Washington does not want to do it. That that's a possibility. I, I did hear that it'd be very shocking if he took another job. V, because I, I think you probably want to take a year off and then he could wind up somewhere else. So we'll see. Um, we'll see what happens. But I, I think five, six wins. I think the schedule is a lot better than what some people thought it was going to be. And A&T's testing themselves, and we'll find out how good they are next season. Now, for Grambling State, it made a new OC hire. I talked a little bit about how I felt about what they needed in an offensive coordinator in my last live stream. But Tony Hall is the guy. He was the Kansas. He was the Kansas running back coach from 2016 to 19. He developed Puka Williams Jr., who was an All American, back to back a thousand yard seasons for the set only the second time in program history for Williams. He also helped develop Khalil Herbert, who's now playing for the Bears. And Herbert had the third best rushing performance in school history with him and with Hull as the coach with almost 300 yards rushing. In one game, he also coached a little bit at Hawaii as the co-OC wide receivers coach and has spent the last two years as the running back coach over at Louisiana Monroe. 
where I really, really like this hire is when you go back to his head coaching history in high school. He coached at Warren Easton down in New Orleans as the head coach and offensive coordinator. Seven playoff appearances in nine seasons. A 2014 state championship appearance. Had back had another semifinal appearance the year after. Coached 45 Division I players. Six ESP and 300 players came from his high school program. And he also coached the Louisiana Gatorade Player of the Year and Deshaun Caper Smith, who was a quarterback who had an outrageous year the year they went to the state championship. Tony Hull was a slam dunk hire because he recruits the area that Grambling has to recruit to, to compete in the SWAC. He has so many Louisiana ties, especially Southern Louisiana ties, that he is going to be able to recruit that area like nobody else. And I really do think that helps Hugh Jackson try to somewhat build a, build a really, really strong pipeline to that Southern Louisiana area. And I'm extremely excited to see what Hull does. And also, he's developed – some really, really good running backs like I talked about in his past, and you already know how loaded at running back Grambling has been. If they can, it, I think, and I agree with with Cam down here, it it sounds like they went out and made a hire, a run-first a run first type guy, a guy who knows how to develop running backs and is going to want to utilize them, and they're going to give the ball to the running back finally. That was my biggest thing, man. Last year, they were so loaded at running back your best offensive weapons were at running back and no and like they never got the ball consistently. It just seemed like every single time a running back got going, either they got banged up or the ball was taken out of their hand. Like I still think Grambling wins to buy you classic if they just run the football. They were eating Southern alive running the football and they just took the ball out of the running back's hands and it was two big turnovers that changed the course of that game. I, I love what his recruit. I love what Hull brings in terms of recruiting, and I really do think his experience and his player development is going to work really well for Grambling State. I think this is a slam dunk hire, and it's someone that complements what Hugh does well. He's he's got ties in state that le- that will help Hugh and some of those other assistants go get the California connection or wherever else they want to recruit. But you know the home base is covered with Tony Hull because he has those type of ties. He's been coaching at the state and the college level as well. On top of, he has all those connections in that New Orleans area, which is so talent rich. I don't think people understand because it's such a small state. Louisiana produces a ton of NFL Power Five talent. Louisiana is absolutely loaded with great high school players that are looking for that opportunity. And Tony Hill can be that guy to unlock that pipeline again and get some guys that potentially Grambling was missing on. And I, I'm really, really excited to see what he does. I talked on that last episode. They needed a guy who was committed to running the football. They need a guy who had recruiting ties around where Grambling needs to recruit. And I think Tony Hull checks off both those boxes. He's a young guy who's going to connect with a lot of the recruits as well. I love this hire for Grambling, man. Congrats, Tony Hull, for being the new offensive coordinator over at Grambling State. Now, transfer portal madness, man. Listen, and if – I only did a few because I didn't want to spend the whole show trying to list, you know, every single commit for every single school or nothing like that. I just picked some of the highlights that I thought were really worth talking about just so you guys can stay updated on who is going where, what the what teams are doing what in the transfer portal. The first one, Noah Washington came from uh, Central Connecticut State University, announced his transfer to Morgan State. He was a second-team all-conference selection this year. Over these past three seasons for uh, Central Connecticut State, 71 total tackles, three sacks, eight tackles for loss, four pass breakups. He is going to already add to what is going to be a loaded defense for Morgan State next year, and I'm not surprised whatsoever, man. Anton Sewell and, and that staff can recruit defensive players that are fast, Get to the football and can and, and are versatile and where they can where they can work from. Noah Washington can fit down in an edge role. He can play outside linebacker. He can play inside. He can cover. He he's a really really versatile piece at the linebacker spot. On top of what Morgan State already has, Damon Wilson is going to have Morgan State competing in an extremely high level this year. And I'm really really excited to see Central versus Morgan State because I really still think that game is going to determine who wins to MEAC this next season. Now. T.J. Smith 
Former Florida, Florida Atlantic quarterback commits to North Alabama. Second team All-State selection was the Russell Florida Player of the Year as a senior in high school. Didn't have a lot of experience at the college level, but North Alabama, new head coach in Dearman. This was a big pickup. They needed a quarterback that could come in, compete for playing time because they had to upgrade at the quarterback spot. TJ Smith does just that, man. So a huge pickup for North Alabama as they look to compete uh, going into next season. Now, FAMU as well. Lands former Eastern Kentucky quarterback DJ, um, I believe it's Boney. Former IMG quarterback was a Shrine Bowl and Cure Bowl selection. Is a extremely dual threat guy. Fifty three hundred total yards and fifty three touchdowns. He can do it all with his legs. He can throw it. His he has a. I will say he. I'll have to pull up some film on him next live stream. He has an unorthodox release. It's going to be interesting to see how Willie Simmons, being a quarterback guy, helps him improve his technique, improve his development. But he looks like he's going to come in and be one of the next up guys. Musa only has one more year of eligibility. They needed some depth and some competition in that quarterback room, and I think that's what DJ is going to bring. I don't expect him to see much time. I don't think there's going to be a quarterback competition with DJ and Musa, but I do think he's going to come in probably – compete for the starting quarterback job in 2024. He's a he's a Florida kid who went up to Eastern Kentucky. Parker McKinney really took over that job, and they're really looking forward, wanting a lot of playing time that was going to be available at Eastern Kentucky. Came closer back home, fits the scheme of what Willie Simmons wants to do. I think DJ could be a really, really good quarterback moving forward. Expect this year to either be one, I don't know if he's used his red shirt year, but potentially a red shirt year, but ultimately a developmental year for DJ <clears throat> is what this year is going to be uh, for DJ over at FAMU. Wayne said Howard still ain't going to get no respect when they beat the stuff out of Morgan again. <laughs> Man, uh, we'll see. I, I, H- Howard's going to be good. Howard will probably be my my number three. I, I want to see. I want to see what they look like at some key positions. I'll just say that one. That's what I'm waiting on Howard for. I hope Morgan doesn't do well. Just so Miak might will hide a little. <laughs> Leave my guy Miak Mike alone, man. Leave, leave my guy Miak Mike alone. But the probably the transfer portal edition of the day that's just happened today. Former Texas AM and Auburn quarterback Zach Calzada announces his transfer to Incarnate Work. Just when you thought Lindsey Scott leaving was going to leave a major void at quarterback for Incarnate Word, they go out and get a guy with 15 games of SEC experience. An Under Armour All-American, a guy who is, is going to step in and offer an immediate upgrade over what they were going to have left over after Lindsey Scott announced for the draft today. Zach Calzada is going to probably start for Incarnate Word, and it's just another quarterback who transfers in a little bit unproven, you know, couldn't really find his groove anywhere else, comes back home to Texas, and is probably going to be a superstar in this Incarnate Word system. He's got the arm strength. He's got much more prototypical size compared to what Lindsey Scott had, and he can absolutely sling it. Wide receiver still going to be loaded. You know, I'm not saying he's going to put up Lindsey Scott numbers wave, but he's he's going to be good enough for them to compete for the Southland again. I'll say that, and they're going they're probably going to compete for another FCS playoff spot. It doesn't look like Cardinal Wars taking a large step back. Man, we said the same thing too. I'll say this waves. We said the same thing when Lindsey Scott came in. We said Lindsey Scott isn't Cameron Ward. He came in and was a lot better than what Cameron Ward was statistically um, coming in. And UIW's got something in the water over there. They keep a quarterback. I'm telling you, shout out to shout out to Coach Clint over there, man. He's recruiting. What's up, Doc? Appreciate you tuning in, man. Also, quarterback Daniel Britt, former Montana quarterback, transfers to Northern Arizona. He was um, the 2021 Montana Scout Team Player of the Year as a true freshman led his high school to the 2019 Nevada State Championship, was 10-0 and as a starter after missing the first few games with injury, led him to a big upset over Bishop Gorman, who all of you guys know, that's where Tate Martell, they were on the QB1 Netflix series, one of the most dominant high school programs in the country. Daniel Britt's a winner. Daniel Britt didn't, you know, I, I don't know why he announced his transfer from Montana, but listen, and Northern Arizona lost R.J. Martinez to the transfer portal. A huge pickup for Northern Arizona as Daniel Britt looks to probably be the starting quarterback next year for the Lumberjacks. Jackson State continuing to recruit 
I mean, TC Taylor's doing a hell of a job recruiting in the transfer portal. Kedrin Cauldron, uh, or or no, my bad, Kedrin Calligan from ULM, Louisiana Monroe defensive back, 26 games of experience. Last season had 40 total tackles, a tackle for loss, a sack, three pass breakups. He's he's going to come in and add a lot of depth at that safety spot for Jackson State. I really do think he could come in and compete for playing time fairly quickly for the Tigers. And due to the safety losses, when you look at Cam, when you look at the injury, uh, the injury questions about great, when you look at Shiloh leaving, a guy like a guy like Keydrain coming in adds a lot of experience and a lot of maturity to a young safety room moving forward. I, I really do think this was a big pickup for Jackson State. It kind of got overlooked due to all the quarterback announcements that Jackson State's had coming, but this is a huge pickup, a very experienced guy who can fill an immediate need and add a lot of depth to a position that was really affected this offseason in the transfer portal, but huge pickup there for Jackson State. Also, a lot of these happened recently, too. Kim Wimberly Jr., Harvard wide receiver, announces his transfer to Delaware. He was a 2022 first-team All-Ivy League selection by myself. Phil Steele, the conference, had, has over 1,000 receiving yards, eight touchdowns in just two seasons for the Crimson. This was a major pickup for Delaware. They had to reload at the wide receiver spot. They lost some of their top contributors. They are going to be loaded at wide receiver next year. They already landed uh, the the – um, I'm blanking on the kid's name. He was from Presbyterian. He was an All-American last season. He redshirted this year. Him and Kim Wimberly are going to be absolute monsters. Kim Wimberly is a guy who is – he's not a burner, but, man, when he can get deep, he can make he, – he uses his body to make insane catches. His catch radius is wild, and I really do think this was a huge upgrade at wide receiver for Delaware going into 2023. Also, Jawan Fari announces his transfer to Eastern Illinois. He was a former Monmouth running back. He was the 2020-2021 Big South Offensive Player of the Year, was an FCS All-American selection, comes with a bunch of experience, man. And Eastern Illinois gets a game-changer at running back. Monmouth, of course, with Jaden Sheridan, it looked like Fari was kind of going to get lost in the fray in terms of the running back production over at Monmouth. He goes to Eastern Illinois, who's really looking to take a step forward in the OVC, and this was a huge pickup for their offense, which at points last year was extremely stagnant. Juwan Fari immediately corrects that for them. When you, anytime you can land an FCS All-American from the CAA, that's a massive pickup for Eastern Illinois. And then also, Kayvon Britton, former UAPB running back, First team all SWAC selection led the SWAC in rushing touchdowns this year. Was number two and was number three in rushing yards. My bad, I, I, that was a typo on, on my part. Commits to Tarleton State, and this is the second second straight year an all conference player from UAPB goes down to Tarleton State. But there was a wide receiver last year from UAPB who went down there and played a big role for them. This is huge for Tarleton State. They were losing most of their top contributors to the running back spot. They landed a guy who was explosive, led the swack in yards per carry, if I'm not mistaken, and Kayvon Britton should go down there and start immediately for them and give them a big play threat in terms of what they're, what they're bringing at running back. So Kayvon Britton to Tarleton State is a huge, huge addition for, for them and also I had to make an own slide and this isn't even all of them I probably could have made five or six slides for Campbell they are up to 11 power five transfers and they have also two or three FCS transfers as well on this roster now Antoine Samp former LSU linebacker was a consensus five star at one point in his recruitment was an Under Armour All-American an ESPN top 300 prospect and was the number one player in his recruiting class in the state of Virginia is going to Campbell former LSU linebacker from Virginia going to Campbell was a consensus five star at one point I don't know what they're doing but they are absolutely recruiting at a ridiculous level and I, this kid's going to be an absolute stud at Campbell. And I think he can probably step down into like a more of an edge role and try to help replace what they're losing with Brevin Allen and also Josh Johnson, but a, a massive pickup for the depth on the defensive line and at the edge linebacker spot for Campbell. Also Deshaun Jerkins headed to Campbell played for Vanderbilt and Ole Miss at DB was a former four star has 35 plus games of sec experience, including over 25 starts 
in the SEC, led Vandy in interceptions in the 2021 season, played sparingly this past season at Ole, at Ole Miss, decided to come down to the FCS level. He's going to be an immediate starter in the secondary. And now you get Deshaun Jerkins at one safety spot. And at the other safety spot, you get four-star Miles Rouser, who was an FCS All-American in his second year, former four-star Miles Rouser at the other safety spot. So you have Deshaun Jerkins at one safety spot and a freshman All-American in his second year, former four-star Miles Rouser at the other safety spot. That is just unfair. And I, I don't know... I don't, I don't know what they're doing. Listen, I'm supposed to have um, new defensive coordinator Patrick Miller from Campbell on the show pretty soon to talk about the recruiting. I need to know his secret sauce. I mean, I don't know what's going on at Campbell. I, y'all can keep asking me. I don't know. But this is getting ridiculous. Also, Elijah Hawk, former Western Michigan defensive lineman, former three-star, was a top 50 prospect in Ohio and was an honorable mention Division I all, Ohio selection out of high school defensive end can slide down into the three tech as well elijah hawk headed to campbell and today let me try to pull it up um so i don't get this kid's name wrong they landed another uh four star today too if i'm not mistaken okay they landed three campbell also landed this is this isn't on the slide they landed former three-star virginia tech defensive lineman lakeem rudolph as well who is an edge rusher so that is a that's another person that they added as well. So 11 Power 5 transfers, two FCS transfers, one being a wide receiver, Tyler Feltkamp from South Dakota State, and the other one being, if I'm not mistaken, an edge rusher from um, Central Connecticut State, which is the same program that Morgan State landed their linebacker. Um, some other transfer portal updates that I don't have listed. Isaiah Hamilton, Texas Southern defensive back, was a first-team all-SWAC selection, was probably one of the best corners um, in the SWAC. He announced his transfer to Houston today. So headed from Texas Southern to Houston is, is a big uh, a big step up, man. He stays close to home, and it, he, he gets to play at the uh, – he gets to play at the Power 5 level as Houston's moving to the Big 12 next year. Also, Josh Griffiths, a uh, big country from Jackson State, former Florida State, Jackson State defensive lineman. He's headed to Tarleton State as well with uh, Kayvon Britton. Also, South Alabama wide receiver Nashawn Dickerson is headed to Grambling State, was a first-team all-region selection in high school. Um also, Grambling State landed Jackson King. He was a JUCO offensive tackle. Listen, this is legit stats. Jackson King for Grambling State, a JUCO offensive lineman, is 6'8", 315 pounds from American River College. Just going to throw that out there. And then also Southern landed three-star Cincinnati linebacker Leroy Bowers, two-time first-team All-Greater Miami Conference selection. It was a first-team All-Southwest Ohio District selection as a senior after he transferred to a high school um, up in Ohio from his high school in Florida. And also Corey Bullock, North Carolina Central offensive lineman, multiple time all conference in the MEAC. Corey Bullock is going from North Carolina Central. He committed to Cincinnati today. So headed to Cincinnati. Um, also, Incarnate Word lands SMU defensive lineman Darren Brown. Darren Brown is 6'1, 323 and is going to add much needed size at defensive tackle. Um, for Incarnate Word. That's another big addition for UIW. And also Norfolk State, got to give those some credit. I kind of I went a little bit hard on them on the roundtable. They landed Sacred Heart cornerback Teron Mallory. Mallory started last year, 31 total tackles, one pick, and two pass breakups. And those are most of the transfer. I think those are all the transfer portal updates that I had for you guys today. Um, so that that is... Uh, that's the most recent thing, man. So for people just now kind of tuning in, I'm, I'm sure I know there's a lot of shows going on. Noah Washington, Central Connecticut State linebacker, headed to Morgan State. TJ Smith, FAU quarterback, headed to North Alabama. DJ, uh, I believe it's Boney he- from Eastern Kentucky to FAMU at quarterback. We also got Zach Calzada, former Texas A&M Auburn quarterback to UIW. Daniel Britt going from Montana to NAU. Keydrain uh, Callaghan going from... Louisiana Monroe to Jackson State. 
And also Kim Wimberly going from Harvard to Delaware, Jawan Fari going from Monmouth to Eastern Illinois, and Kayvon Britton from UAPB to Tarleton State. And then, of course, there's the Campbell domination of the world, apparently, at this point. They got the number one high school class in the country at the FCS level. And on top of that, they have one of the best transfer classes in the FCS now as well. So a lot going on here. And, oh, man, it's just – I really do feel like – also, call lines are just now open, 701-779-9585, up in the, up in the top of the graphic. You guys can call in and definitely like the, like the stream. Thank you, Paris. Um, but I really do think Campbell – the, the thing that worries me about Campbell, and I've, I've talked to coaches about this. This isn't, this isn't a surprise for anybody. I really feel like they if they could have stayed in the Big South one more year, it could have been game-changing for that program. Because I do, they're not – I'm sorry. I, I don't see them winning the CAA. I don't see them finishing top three in the CAA. You recruited all this talent, and I feel like – they haven't had a lot of winning seasons in school history and they really need, I think the biggest thing is getting over that hump of we can win a conference championship with this recruiting class, with, with this coaching staff. But the problem is now they're going to a, a loaded conference, the biggest conference in FCS. It's like, is that talent going to pop out like it would if you would have stayed in the big South OVC merger for one more season? That's a huge. That's a huge issue for me because it's like I feel. I do feel like they're getting better because I agree with, with V. It's like every year we hear that you know Campbell's getting better. Campbell's making improvements. Listen, I've been driving the bandwagon. I love Coach Mentor, man. One of my favorite people to interview. Love Coach Miller, man. I got I got his number, man. He texts he texts me all the recruits so I can keep it, you guys updated. But it's just like, man, are they setting themselves up for? Are they really setting themselves up for the best step moving forward? Like, could it could it have been you stay in the Big South OVC merger for one, two more years, win a, win a conference championship or two, and then move to the CAA? I understand you have to move if you're offered it because you never know if that opportunity is going to come again. It's just I don't know if they're going to be able to prove to everyone that they're not overrated year one in the CAA. It's just... I hate it because I really want. I, I really do think Campbell can be a really good team. I'm I'm hoping they prove everyone wrong, but it's just man, it's going to be a much tougher road to do that in the CAA than it would have been, um, than it would have been in the Big South. And and David, I'm about to I'm about to get to you. Let me address this comment. Um, no, they're not in the same comp. Oh, Jacksonville State just moved up, Vic. Jacksonville State will be FBS next year. They're in the same conference A and T's in. William and Mary, Richmond, Delaware, Villanova, um, Townsend. I mean, who else? Rhode Island. Um, you you got Hampton now too. You got North Carolina A and T. I mean, it's a loaded conference with a lot of people. Who, Elon, a lot of people who have been in the playoffs and and really stacked. Um, they they the conference is really good. I'll just say that. D, you live. Oh, uh, what's going on, Blue? What's good, man? Oh man, I'm I'm thrilled about the ANC coaching hire, man. Uh, and he's he seems very optimistic about this upcoming season. I'm trying to temper my expectations a bit. I don't expect him to to go wild in the conference. I'm thinking maybe five or six wins this year, but we'll see. It's going to be interesting to say the least. I've looked at that schedule, man. We got a we got a rough draw, especially in the middle of that schedule. So I got That's the schedule sure. pulled up on the screen for everyone else. What, what games do you think one you have to win and which ones, you know, are you like, uh, I feel like, I've, like give me your 50, 50 games and give me your must win games on the schedule. We, we haven't lost the, we haven't lost Elon in like, it's been a minute since we lost to Elon, but I know they were ranked this year. Yeah, they so, were good this year. Even though, I, yeah, we're good this year. Even though we, even though we haven't, even though we haven't, um, even though the game's on the road, I still think we have a chance to beat them. So I think we could beat Elon. Central's probably going to be a 50-50. I know they're going to have some level of confidence, but I think we have a shot to beat those guys too. Um, we have to beat Norfolk State on the road. That Villanova, Delaware, Richmond combo, that's going to be rough, man. Um, the two. Two of those three are home games. 
we got to be able to steal one of them. I just don't know which one is feasible. Um, I don't think we'll be Delaware on the road. I'm realistic about that. But I think one of those two are 50-50s. Villanova. But I, but I'm, the, yeah, probably Nova. It's yeah, probably the 50-50. I don't think we can beat Richmond. Richmond's we could be Hampton at home. Go ahead. Oh, I said Richmond's going to be really good next year. I mean, Richmond was one play away from probably beating Sac State on the road in the quarterfinals this year. Like, I mean, their quarterback, I think, completed almost 80% of his passes this year, and they've been – they've returned a lot of talent. I'll, I'll say that. I know they lost their All-American linebacker, but outside of that, their secondary returns a lot of talent as well. So I think – and Villanova has a lot of QB issues. I think yeah. Villanova – traveling to a t if the defense can put the game on the quarterback and unless they you know uh, listen i say that it's january 10th that they land another quarterback then this is an, a mute conversation but based on this year villanova is a winnable game for a t i'll say that well the thing that's going to be interesting is a t is going to have a t has got to figure out quarterback too right because remember tyler is graduated Tyler's done so we got we got three young quarterbacks on our roster right now and all three of them were hurt last year. Do you think – So, uh, is, there, is it a guarantee that Brown believes in any of them? Is there a chance that he could go into the portal and bring in his own guy? I don't know, man. I have no idea. It'll be his OC. I, I mean – He's a defensive guy, so he probably isn't making the call. Whoever he hires as OC, I think, will tell us everything we need to know about how they feel about the quarterback spot. Because if he goes and gets – because I, I saw, I know the freshman y'all landed as a dual threat guy. If they go get a pro style, but he's not going to play next year. He's not going to play. Oh, I'm, I'm with you on that. Yeah, he's not ready to play. But you guys, what yeah. got two dual threat guys and then a, a guy who could probably do both? If they go get a pro style, I'll be really surprised if they don't go get a quarterback in the portal. Yeah. Yeah, we got time there. So, so that's one. That's one thing. Because like a, they. They asked him about what they're going to do about the staff, and he did, he pretty much said he's going to try to get an elite staff. He said he might keep some of the staff, but he's also going to get his own. So he's going to probably fill the staff pretty quickly. So we'll probably know soon enough. I'm thinking you have to do it prior to the, the next signing period. Oh, yeah. Um, it, it, it's got to be done in two weeks, two to three weeks. Yeah. And maybe not fully done, but you need your OC, your DC, and you need probably – three, four assistants on each side of the football kind of set in stone. And then like, if you have to fill in holes later, like you can do that, but you have to at least have the foundation of your staff done, Bob. It, I would say at least two weeks. Yeah. Like we'll be, so the rest of the schedule will be Hampton on the road. And we'll be Townsend. I think we could be Townsend at homecoming. That I, I don't think they'll be able to handle the environment. And I hope, for my sake, we'll beat Rhode Island on the road because I'm probably going to be going to that game. That's why I, I live in Rhode Island, so I hope we can beat them on the road. Closing out the season with Campbell is going to be interesting, man, because I understand Campbell always has those um, the recruits. They always got a really good recruiting class, but we just haven't seen it. We haven't seen that equate to wins yet. I still so, think that's going to be a good game because, I mean – as much it as is. ANT won it this year, it was a hell of a game. Mm-hmm. So I don't, I don't think that's a give me win. That's probably a competitive game. Okay. I'm with you on Hampton. I think ANT is better than Hampton, unless something significant changes with that program. Townsend's it, it's kind of a like question mark. You know, I interviewed the head coach today. That'll be coming out tomorrow. He's a, he's been successful fairly quickly everywhere he's been. He was the coach that won the national title with. Um, West Florida, and he won the national title yeah. with a true freshman quarterback in like year two or three. Because <laughs> do you remember the kid who went to who played for uh, Western Kentucky this year, Austin Davis, I think. Yes. Yeah, he's the freshman quarterback that won the national title with the head coach that's now at Townsend. Oh God! All right, so that's not going to be an easy one. Oh, he's of a hell of a get coach. A, not so. A nice so easy game at homecoming. Okay. That's 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 G Ho. Yeah, I, that's why I give y'all the advantage. If it's homecoming, I think y'all can get it out. And I like I said, it's a big question mark because Towson's a big rebuild. 
I mean, they went to what the national title in like 2013 ish or something like that. Since then, it's yeah. been a a downhill roll to say the least. Now he's recruited pretty well. He landed a quarterback um, from Liberty. He landed Liberty's backup quarterback. That was pretty good. That'll probably be their starting quarterback this year. But there's a lot of spots on the defense for Townsend that has to be that has to be replaced. So I still think that's a winnable game for you guys. And I agree, Rhode Island's beatable too. Rhode Island lost some bad games this year. I'll throw that out there. They were ranked at one point, and they were they were a little iffy. So I think the only games that to me are unwinnable are UAPB. I mean, or UAB. My bad, UAB. And then I think. Delaware Richmond are going to be games that I, I would be hard pressed to see A&T winning those games. The the UAB game is probably August 31st, I believe. I don't think it's on the second. I think it's August 31st. And like I've been hearing stuff about the trend for hire, man. Like things to the effect of the players aren't happy with the hire and things of that sort. So I'm kind of, but I agree. We don't really. I think depending on how things go with the portal and what happens with the players? I think we still got a lot of we got a lot of work to do to even be competitive with UAB in the first game. So yeah, especially tough. I mean they got a new coach too. I mean, but Dilfer's been recruiting at next level and UAB. I mean, to be honest, because I, I always hear because before A and M played them, there was a lot of people in different areas of the HBCU media sphere that was like man, we can beat these group of five teams. We can beat that, but like not really taking into account that there's levels even in group of five. Like UAB is an elite group of five team. All, all due respect, we're not Alabama a and No, no, I, I'm We've with you on before. that. They're, like they were taking <laughs> knees. They, they were taking knees in the red zone with like eight minutes left. They're not going to do them like that. I think it will be more of the fact of like, 38 10 maybe or you know yeah. even like a 31 13 something like that it'll be more respectable i don't see them beating you guys 59 to nothing and taking these at the two yard line yeah nah nah we'll we'll show something but i think the problem that we're going to have if we don't have the quarterback situation handled that's going to be the game where we're going to figure it out because unlike last year where we were trying to figure it out at the central game the central and north dakota state and duke we're going to be trying to figure it out at the UAB game initially, I would think. so. Yeah, you, you, you know, have because... to figure it out at, at that point. I, I'm excited for them, though, man. I get to talk to head coach Brown. I don't know if you were on the stream, man. I got an interview with him on Thursday, and I'm really excited to kind of you know ask him some questions and kind of see what he's thinking. Because, man, I saw y'all's press conference. Bro, what was the last question? Because, good oh, Lord. God. Let me tell you something, man. <laughs> I thought it was the same guy. I thought it was the same guy that went at San Washington during the season, during the season last season. But I, I think we found out that it was not the same guy. Um, it was a bad, but, it was yeah, bad, man. It started out bad and it just like spiraled from there. I knew it was going to be a wrap as soon as I heard it. As soon as he said class of 81 and then he said 83, I knew it was going to be bad immediately. I knew it was over that point forward. I knew it was done. I knew it was a wrap. As soon as he didn't know his class year, I knew it was over at that point. I said, it's a wrap. It a wrap. <laughs> Man, I was dying. I was watching the, the stream. Like I went back and watched. I didn't get to see it live. And I kind of saw Twitter go, talking about something. I'm like, man, I, it can't be that bad. And like, it's like oh, yeah. about halfway through. I was like, oh, it, it it was it was just as bad as Stephen Gaither was tweeting about. I watched it live. I was at work, and I had it like I was at work, and I was listening to it while I was working on some stuff. And like, as soon as he said class of '81, I mean '83, I knew it was over. I knew what was about to happen. He was going to talk, and I knew he was going to talk about the football budget. But then I knew that Chancellor was going to shut him down because I know I'm, I know my Chancellor, and he definitely shut him down. And I knew that was the last question of the day, too. It's always a double-edged so. sword. Like, I, I like the fact that A&T kind of opened up the mic for, like, legit questions from people who are, you know, supporting the program. But it's like, at the same time, when you're doing it live, you got a new head coach, like, everyone's there. Like, you also do have to – like, you had to screen – somewhat of the questions in my opinion like I, I like how they opened it up to like a forum but like man you, eventually you're gonna have to be like okay what are you gonna ask so my thing is like 
considering how the whole Stan Washington situation happened, I knew somebody was going to ask, right? So I was like, all right, somebody's going to ask. You expect that. You're going to get the answer that you're going to get. And they're just, and you just need to accept that. And they handled that fine. It wasn't mad at that whatsoever. But then when, when the alumni went and went on the rails about the budget, I said, dude, just ask the damn question. Just ask the question. If you want to know what the budget is, just ask it. Earl will tell you. Earl will tell you what it is. He and 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 I'm pretty sure Coach Brown wouldn't have accepted the job if they didn't give him insurances that it was going off the budget. But I know that the chancellor wants to wants to up the athletic budget without necessarily upping the student fees because he feels like they're too high as it is for the students. So that will be interesting. Uh, I know I was looking. I got I got to do a show on it because I was kind of looking at the makeup of athletic budgets around like the FCS. And I don't think people realize like how high some of the like student fees are for some of like the upper echelon of the FCS. Like some of the teams that you just think are getting like ridiculous funding from, from elsewhere, man, their student fees are outrageous compared to like the other well, the FCS is, programs. The thing is too, like even when, even, I don't know if that's the case now, but before JMU made the decision to go up to FBS, 80% of their budget was paid by the student fees. Right? Yeah, that's so, a lot of them. Like, yeah. the, like, even like the North Dakota, South Dakota states, like a large percentage is like all paid for by student fees. You, know, you got to have enrollment. <laughs> but I, if I'm not I think mistaken. the big challenge for A&T is that they're compared to all the state schools. Like, there's 16 schools in the in the North Carolina system, in the UNC system. So if you're one of the highest in student fees, eventually something's going to give, and they're going to call you out on it. So you got to have another way to pay for it. That's a fact. Because what's, what's A&T's enrollment right now? We're on pace to hit 14,000 by the fall of next year. So we're like around 13,500 students right now. So you guys are like, if I'm not mistaken, like that, I got to hang on. I'm going to double check it before I say it on the show. But as I saw BJ tweet something out, like I think that's bigger than even like North Dakota State's enrollment. Probably. Let's see, North Dakota State. But North Dakota enrollment. State gets a lot of private funding too. Like they yeah, got that the, indoor facility paid privately. Yeah. So right? North Dakota, <laughs> North Dakota State is 14.3. Yeah. And yeah, like, like, cause, People don't know this, but like North Dakota has some weird, uh, like law because um, the AD talked about it on the show that I had him on. The state won't fund like any privately owned, like built like that. Like the state won't contribute any funding for the new football facility, indoor practice. So, like they had to like all profit raise it by boosters and stuff like that, and they literally paid all with just like behind the scenes booster money. It's like insane how they fundraise that. Yeah, but at the same time, you gotta also understand about the geography the, the geography of it all too, right? North Dakota state is different than a North Carolina A T or North Carolina Central where you have to compete with everything around you. Oh, that's like A and T is the only division one football program in the city of Greensboro. But Wake Forest is 30 minutes away. Duke, Duke, UNC is 45 minutes away. North Carolina Central is 45 minutes away. <laughs> yeah, no, you guys are. UNC Charles, yeah, you like, guys have, so. like, because when, I, when, I, when I traveled to the, um, what game did I travel to? It was either Campbell or Elon. I was talking to one of the SIDs about, because, you know, even, like, those programs, Got to. He was talk, telling me about how much they got to compete with like different schools. He was like, "Man, UNC, NC State, Wake Forest, Duke, Central, Elon, A and T, Campbell." He was like, "Man, all of us are like right here on top of each other." Yeah, it's ridiculous how many schools are like in that just like one little state because like North Carolina is really not that big. I joke all the time. I said the moment that UNC Greensboro decides to have a football program is when A and T will be in a panic because now you got to compete within the city. Like they already got a basketball team, so, so the last thing you need is them to have a football team too. 
<laughs> no, no kidding, man. Well, hey, I, that, man, I appreciate you calling in, man. Great information. And I'm looking forward to seeing what A&T does this year. Oh, yeah, this is going to be a fun one. Hey, man, appreciate you. This is going to be a fun season. Yep, have a good one, man. All right, call the number is 701-779-9585. If you want to call in and D, um, upcoming interview. So my one with Coach Hampton from UAPB got rescheduled due to some things, you know, he had to do behind the scenes. Uh, head coach for uh, Townsend, Pete Shinnick, dropping tomorrow. It is a phone interview, man, so it won't be um, any video or anything. It'll be on podcast room platforms. It'll be an article on the website. It'll be on YouTube, but it'll be kind of like – what you watch on Paul Feinbaum when he has a caller call in, he'll say like on the phone, he'll have him and everything. Uh, on Thursday, head coach Vincent Brown, North Carolina a ts new head coach, former William & Mary defensive coordinator, will we'll have an interview with him that will be dropping on Friday. And then next week, uh, Clint Killew, uh, Incarnate Words, new head coach, will also be on the show. And then to tonight, as I was as I was recording this show, I'm also in the works of getting an interview set up for Northern Colorado's new head coach, um, Ed Lamb. So that will also be coming as well. So we, um, I'm really trying to spotlight all the new head coaches across the FCS. I'm also working behind the scenes on getting Kendrick way from Valley on the show as well, but they just introduced him today. And also I, until it's finalized, I guess I can't really confirm or, or anything on Ed Reed, but I am working behind the scenes to have it where as soon as Ed Reed is confirmed, Ed Reed's coming on the show. Uh, to for, for an interview, man. So I'm really trying to work behind the scenes with Bethune Cookman to set that up. But I'm sure you guys have seen on social media, he's in Daytona working on like the final touches on the contract and it hasn't uh, necessarily been finalized. So that's that's the interviews right now. Giovanni McCoy's interview is up from the FCS National Championship. He's a 2022 Jay Rice Award winner. The Lindsey Scott interview, uh, 2022 Walter Payton Award winner is in the works as well. And then on top of that, um, I'll also be working on player interviews throughout the off season on top of all the recruiting coverage, all the live streams, everything like that. So the website will also be rebranding. It'll go to the blueblood.cfb.com rather than the bluebloodspod.com. I'm rebranding everything as an as a media organization. And then the podcast will just be under that umbrella of the media organization uh, to open a few more doors, man, to get you guys more access, more content. Uh, throughout next season and, and moving forward at the FCS level and even some of the FBS level. Also, now we really didn't talk about it. Um, the, the FBS national championship was a disappointment. I'll say that. I know a lot of you guys turned it off at halftime like I did. I went straight to bed. 60-something to 7, it was the most disgusting game of all time, and TCU used to no chance from the jump. And I, I know a lot of people were saying how um, – overrated TCU was I, I told you guys on the preview Georgia played a C plus game C minus game against Ohio State and they were going to be scared they played an A plus game and you saw what happened when they played an A plus game because things got extremely ugly last night out in California eight nine four five you're live Sorry, man. <laughs> what's good man uh, well, you man, you gonna be working now. You, you like you been putting miles on the car. You about to work overtime with the interview, and you trying to do a big. <laughs> Hey man, that's that's what I try to do. That's what I try to do for everybody, man. Is what work hard. I think what with the FCS championship now, I think this year I went to uh, like sixteen different games and drove so the only game i flew to was montana state because i won't go and drive to montana all the other games i drove and i think it's somewhere like almost around seven thousand miles driven and i went to games in texas louisiana mississippi alabama tennessee multiple in north carolina um georgia and montana were all the states i went to games in um so I'm about to say that Vince Brown hired to me, like that's a fire, that's a dope hire for A and T though, like on the real. I I I would agree with what they said. That is a uh, that's a dope uh, hire for them, and you get somebody that that knows the backyard of the CAA and and uh, um, NFL pedigree, also, you know, what I'm saying to 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 boot. 
I, I'm with you. They had to have somebody, either one, you had to have like a game changing celebrity hire. Because I don't think even even with the brand name of Cam Newton, you know, me and Scotty went back and forth on it. He has the brand name, but I don't think he has the experience. You needed a, a slam dunk celebrity hire with coaching experience that could be that game changer. Or you had to get someone who had experience at the FCS level. And that's what you get in Brown. I don't think he would have got a head. He wasn't a head coach yet. But he was the next big name in the FCS level to get a head coaching job. And now AT gives him that chance. And then on top of that, you, in my opinion, you got someone who satisfied both sides of your fan base. You got the side that wants to compete in the CAA because you got a guy with that experience. But you also got a guy who has connections to the HBCU experience, was an HBCU graduate, and, and all the and checks all the boxes on that side. So I think you please both sides of the alumni base with the hire of Vincent Brown. Another question: Have you heard anything about as far as the uh, how the coach, what the coaching staff, uh, when they're going to introduce the coaching staff? Because there's a lot of people that ask me about it uh, when they're going to introduce. But you know, most of the most of the time, I'm telling them, I won't. I don't even know yet until TC actually, you know, actually puts it out there. And and like I said, knowing TC, he's a He's a quiet type person as far as keeping it, keeping stuff to himself. But uh, you haven't heard anything as far as um, like are the hires that he had are they going to be efficient and when they're going to be um, when they're going to actually uh, introduce the culture staff. Well, I mean. They're not official in the sense that they've announced it yet. I'm sure they got a date in mind, and I'm sure I'm sure Jackson State wants to do a full rollout and do it their way. That's kind of been the narrative and the approach of TC. Is like we're going to do it Jackson State's way, and we're going to we got to on how to attack social media, attack publicity, and we're going to control our own narrative this time. So I, I don't know when the date is, but I know it's uh, it's gonna it's gonna have to come eventually. But all the hires that have been leaked are pretty much confirmed. Like, I know everyone wants to wait for the school to announce and everything to be kind of like official on the website, but it's official. Like, when you have recruits tagging coaches, thanking them for offers to Jackson State, like, like you don't need the school to confirm anything. Like, if the coach is already offering kids on behalf of Jackson State, like, it's confirmed. That's why football scoop on three, two, four, seven, Adam Scheffner, you know, whoever you want to put as like an insider. That's why these things are so accurate. All, like that's that's the key, and I think that's what a lot of newer people in the sports media game don't get, especially college football. Is all the insiders? If you want, if you want the inside scoop, make relationships with the recruits. They talk. They love to talk. They love to talk because they because they they think it makes them. It's like the coolest thing to be talking to media as a high schooler. So they'll just tell you whatever. Yeah, this coach is here, and this is what he offered me, and this is what he told me. That's how all the inside information leaks in college football for the most part is assistance in the front office and recruits. And so it, it's pretty much confirmed. Like the Alcorn coach is confirmed, the Liberty coach, the quarterback coach, all the ones that have leaked, it's pretty much confirmed outside of just like the official announcement on the website because they wouldn't be offering kids on behalf of Jackson State if they weren't already employed. Final thing, man. Look, uh, I like I said, I know you had a good time in Frisco because, uh, you know, I've seen it. Like, like they, the Dakotas, the Dakota State Schools, they packed out Toyota Stadium. Uh, that was a good thing. Uh, I think it's probably like almost over a little bit over 20,000, 21,000. Well, was they, the took, they took some. Um, so I know everyone's looking online at the capacity. They sold it out. But what they did is in, in one of the end zones, they took out seats so they could have the stage for the trophy ceremony and, and like had it where like the bands could sit next to each other and have like a like a one two band section. So they took some like seating out. So it would have been over 20K. There was a bunch of standing room only tickets where people were standing up in the back. So they sold it out based on what the actual yeah. like attendance was. I don't remember what the exact number was, but I will say this the difference between that. And some of the other FCS games that I've been to is like, yeah, I didn't have the 50K number that people are bragging about or anything. But, bro, when I'm telling you, from kickoff until the end of the game, not a single person. It was loud. And not a single person in any seat sat down. 
Like I'm talking about, they stood up and cheered the entire game and it was so loud in there on the field. And like that, it reminded me of it. Like, I love environments like that. Like, man, I don't care. I, I've been to, I, I won't call them out. I've been to P5 stadiums for power five schools where they have so much attendance, but the fans are just boring and they don't get into the game. Oh bro. Like, it's just not fun. I would rather have a smaller crowd where everyone's in tune with what's going on in the game, cheering. They're not sitting down. They got, and you had people in bunny suits, you had signs. It was like, it was a fun environment and it was a, it was a hell of a game Man. to be at. I was really glad I got to right. experience it. Cause I was at, I, I worked 15 minutes from, from uh, Frisco. And I was like, man, if I uh, if I'd have just took off, I, I just took off for the day. I would have went up there. But and last man, I'm um I'm happy for TCU for making you know getting all the way to the Natty because they wasn't expected to get there. But then again, hey man, you can't you can't get destroyed like that. <laughs> you can't you can't represent the state and get destroyed like that. You can't. <laughs> But I, I congratulate them for having a uh, true, a phenomenal season. So, yeah, it's, but, uh, it's disappointing man, how it I'll ended. I'll holler though, bro, man. All right, man. Appreciate you calling in. Uh huh. Shout out to Doc. Um, man, call the number. I'll, I'll probably be live for just a few more minutes, man. Seven zero one seven seven nine nine five eight five, or you can put your comments in the chat. But man, I agree, Sonny. But and, and this, it, man, it's it's not. It not calling out anyone because I went to 15 different games this year, 16 different games, whatever it was, and there were only a handful that were like that. There were so many where it was like the fans were just were not engaged with what was going on, like it, it were caught up in something else, or they didn't really. It, it was just different. Like, man, it if you've been to a game that is like that, that has the energy. Like, man, you can just feel the energy in the stadium when you walk in, man. It is just a different feeling. And you could tell, and, and that makes sense because it's a rivalry game. I mean, the Dakota marker is a huge deal up in the Dakotas. And for all those fans to sell out the stadium, I, I don't know how many miles. Maybe someone can look it up in the chat. I mean, how many miles is is Frisco from Fargo or Brookings? Man, it is it is crazy how far they travel. I mean, they, they showed out in droves, and there were a lot of people who didn't even come in the stadium that were just tailgating. Uh, and <laughs> Vic said the game was very high. But anytime I see someone in striped overalls, I know it'll be a show. I, I'm te I'm telling you, man, there were people in overalls, bunny suits. I mean, it, it was wild. I mean, the fact that people because it was it was kind of chilly, man. I was surprised. I thought it was going to be hot, but it ended up being a pretty cool day. But I, I was like, man, if you think I'm going to be wearing a bunny suit for hours on end, tailgating and going to the stadium, zero chance. He will not catch your boy in a bunny suit, man. Shout out to my guy, the Rev, though, for pulling out the bunny suit. And it, it was just, it was such a great environment, man. And then even storming the field, like I was talking about earlier, in the crowd, like, you know, there could have been some family in there, whatever, but like there were fans that were crying at the national, at the trophy presentation because of how much it meant to win the first national title in school history. And I, I think people who have even been to the FBS national championship, who have won a national championship at whatever level, man, you could just tell the players, like, those were some of my favorite pictures I took. I took it with my phone. I didn't bring any of my camera equipment, man. I just wanted to experience the game. Just the pictures I got from the trophy presentation of the players and the coaches celebrating, and, and you could see the emotion on their face, man. Those were some of my favorite pictures I've taken all year because you just – you could tell how bad they wanted it, man, against their rival, against uh, their first national championship to end the streak to a point – it, it was huge. And also, man, South Dakota State's now won four straight games over North Dakota State. That is huge, man. That's a crazy streak when, when you can um, when you consider what all North Dakota State has accomplished. So shout out to Coach Stig and, and the South Dakota State Jackrabbits, man. They they have been balling out. He, people from Fort Worth was on their soapbox talking about TCU. It's not DFW. It's only Fort Worth. And now Fort Worth not even claiming TCU. <laughs> Football for some fan base is more of a social event and sporting event. That's fair. Uh, Coach Prime said he may chase that TCU game to Arizona State. <laughs> I mean, but man, it, it was a, a great year of college football, man. I hate that it's over now. Listen, we're shifting gears into all star games. We got, I'm, I've already been credentialed for the Senior Bowl. Um, I should be at the HBCU Legacy Bowl as well. 
Um, I'm trying to think if I'm missing any all-star guys. That's probably the two I'm going to go to and, and cover. I'm really, really looking forward to bringing you guys content and really spotting the FCS players, whether it's Aubrey Miller, Cody Malk. Um, I mean, who else you want to throw in there? At the HBC Legacy Bowl, it's all HBC FCS players pretty much outside of the few D2 players that go. I'm really, really excited to see what happens next, man. I'm really, really hoping that all the success of the NFL players that from the FCS that are balling out, man, from Christian Watson being one of the best wide receivers for the Packers, for James Houston doing what he's doing. Um, who who else do you want to throw throw in the list of FCS guys that are balling out from Dakobe Durant for South Carolina State doing his thing? Um, you know, Trevor Penning got hurt. Cole Strange playing for the Patriots on the offensive line. It's like, man, all these FCS guys are going out here and showing out. I'm really, really hoping that that kind of pushes some NFL teams to take some chances on some FCS guys in this next NFL draft. I really, really want to see that record broken. If I'm not mistaken, the record somewhere in the 30s in terms of total FCS players in one draft being taken is as unrealistic as it possibly may be. I would love to see nothing more than like 40-plus FCS players get drafted one year. I want it so bad. I mean, listen – Cody Mock is going to get drafted. Aubrey Miller is is going to get drafted. Um, I mean, who else? Tucker Craft's going to get drafted. I mean, I, I think there's a long list. I, I can probably, I can. Mark Evans is is going to get drafted, in my opinion. Um, Hunter Lipke's probably going to get drafted. I'm just trying to think of everyone off the top of my head. I, I wish Lindsey Scott would get drafted. He deserves it, but we'll see on him. Um, I just I, I'm really really hoping we see a record year for FCS people. Uh, Paris, um, the first All Star games this weekend, the Hula Bowl is Saturday. The Hula Bowl down in Orlando will be the first All Star game if I'm not mistaken this Saturday. Uh, Brock Purdy's FBS. He's from Iowa State. Um, that's the Pac-12 wants it in house. Pac-12 versus Pac-12 for ratings and their TV deal is still pending. Why have those games? They don't play football. What games? Russell, what are you talking about? What game? I don't know what games you're talking about. How many were HBC guys a year? It was 30. I don't know. I don't know off the top of my head. Um, I don't even remember what year it was. I'm just trying. I just I know it's somewhere in the 30s. Uh, was was one year that w- was the highest year in terms of FCS guys <clears throat> drafted. Yeah, Shaq is probably going to get a look at the NFL as well. I'm trying to remember how many guys Isaiah Land. Two should probably get a big look. I don't, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how he gets evaluated. Um, I, I'm very, very interested to see how he gets evaluated. I think he's done enough to, to get a shot, but it's going to be interesting to see where he gets drafted, like what his draft grade is going to be in terms of where he goes. Also, um, McClendon Curtis for Chattanooga offensive line is probably going to get drafted fairly high as well. He's an absolute animal offensive lineman i'm a big i'm a big fan of um i'm a big fan of his game let's see lindsey scott's a baller ndsu fans calling for for uh for head coach's head he's 48 and 6 against everyone but sdsu one and four against the jacks that's outrageous that, that is crazy so let's treat ndsu like what a sweat school it's time for a coaching change <laughs> <laughs> oh man yes i don't see land playing edge i don't think I, I could outside linebacker possibly being an edge rusher and specialized key third down situations would probably be where you see Lane getting moved, uh, Vic. But I, I don't see him playing true defensive end at the next level. He's definitely going to be an edge rusher slash line. I mean, it's kind of what he was. It that's what he was listed at at FAMU. But I see him playing more outside linebacker at the next level. Uh, I, I, I'm hoping he. I'm hoping he's successful, man. I think this year struggle with injuries. A lot of people were game planning against him, double teaming him and things like that. Um, but I think Isaiah Lane can be successful, and I'm really, really hoping he is, man. I want all the FCS guys to be successful at the next level, man. I think everybody, regardless of your school, man, like I feel like there's like this weird divide between like the FCS community, man. You like you should be rooting, even if the team's not in your conference, for FCS guys to get drafted because it helps your school. Like the more FCS guys they get drafted, the better for your school. So everybody should be happy regardless of where the kid comes from. FCS players being drafted is good for your school if it's an FCS school. Regardless of how you feel, it is. I think so. 
Cam. Mark Evans should be a day two lock. He's such a monster, man. If not, it, round two to four is where I see him going, Cam. That's where it should be. I think Isaiah Bolden is probably an undrafted free agent, Paris. If not, probably I think seventh round to undrafted free agent unless he goes out and kills his all-star game. I, I think that's about it, man, because P- – I always say this every year, and I'll probably reiterate it on the next show because we're probably going to be talking a lot about the draft. People don't understand how hard it is to be a draft pick, too. You have 200-some-odd picks, and you have hundreds of, of programs, and you have programs like Georgia getting 15 of those draft picks, and then you got Bama getting 10, and then you got LSU getting 6, and... Ole Miss getting four and and Michigan getting three and Ohio State getting eight. And then you start, you kind of look at the total picks and it's really like the FCS programs, the D2 programs, even the group of five programs are competing for probably somewhere under 150 spots, possibly even closer to 100 in terms of the draft. It is so hard to get drafted. So I think Bolden's probably a seventh round to undrafted free agent. And I think his special teams is why I kind of bump them up to potentially get drafted. Teams love guys who can be contributors on special teams, especially as rookies and especially late round draft picks. So special teams is key. And the fact that Bolden is such a dynamic special teams player is why he does have a chance of getting drafted more so than his DB skills. I think his DB skills are somewhere in that in that undrafted free agent range. But because of that special teams ability and the, the ability to be a game changer in that aspect is why I can see him someone taking a waiver late in the draft for him. And and I agree here with Wayne, man. I'm hoping Nugget can get on a practice squad, be an undrafted free agent, and work his way up. I think he got kind of a a, a bad shake at Jackson State. He had that explosive spring season. The next season, he he struggled with getting on the field. And then this past season, you know, we saw in the documentary, he really struggled with his mental health and, and kind of getting things on the right track. But I think when I, I think the on the documentary, I don't remember who said it, but when Nuggets rolling, he is an NFL type player, and I think that's true. It's just can all the extracurricular stuff, off the field stuff, can that all get corrected? And that's a big question surrounding Nugget, and I think he can. And I really do hope he goes to the NFL, finds an opportunity somewhere, and goes and balls out because I think he has that type of talent. I completely agree with you, Wayne. I really like the tight end flex for South Carolina State. Yes, um, you're talking about. Um, Man, both their tight ends are so good, Vic, and both of them are seniors. Zach Hines and Tucker Craft. If you saw Zach Hines, who is 87 or 89, I'm blanking. I think it's 87. They're they're one of their tight ends, Vic. If you saw, he was wearing kind of a bigger like cleat. He had a broken foot. South Dakota State Zach Hines played in the national championship with a broken foot and was mauling people in the blocking aspect of his game. So they, you got guys playing with broken feet out here. And he's out here balling out, man. Shout out to Zach Hans and, and his balling. But yeah, Tucker Craft, in my opinion, Vic's probably going to be a second round pick. Number 85, he can stretch the field. He can block. You can put him in the slot. He could, you could do so much with him. He can play special teams. I, I really would be surprised if Tucker Craft fell below the second round. Um, in terms of Kamari, man, I, I was really high on him coming into this year. He didn't have the year a lot of people expected him to D. But I still think he has the he has the measurables and the skill set to fit in somewhere. Now, I don't know if he'll get drafted. I'll be honest with you, especially after the year he had. It's all going to come down to what he does in the All Star games and how we tested his pro day. If he tests out the roof, like I think he can, because he, he's a freak of nature. I can see someone taking a waiver on him late in the draft. But because of his, his production, really suffered this year. I do think that he's kind of on that fringe aspect of whether he's going to get drafted or not, but he fits really well into the NFL prototype of where the game's going in terms of the Kyle Pitts, the um, the Darren Wallers, that type of tight end system. I, I really do think Kamari Everett can, can find a place at the next level. It's just depending on whether someone's going to take that flyer on him in the in the late rounds. And also with projecting players drafted, guys, it all comes down to interviews where we're not in the room. Whether it, it whether a team sees them fitting a role that you know we might not know they need, it's just a lot of chance in terms of whether NFL scouts vouch for you enough in the back rooms. And so once you get past probably the top three four rounds, it's really hard to project who's going to take a flyer on who because all those draft rankings go out the windows. 
I mean, that, that go, it goes out the window. You never know what the team is necessarily looking for or what they see in a guy and what type of role he can fit in the late rounds of the NFL draft. So it's a lot of a lot of guessing and a lot of team fits and a lot of scheme fits and things that, you know, I think a lot of analysts overlook in terms of how players are going to fit in certain spots. And then also you got those crazy late round trades where you got guys trading up and down and out of out of rounds and out of the draft and and, and you just don't you don't you don't know. Kendall said SDSU had tight ends, wide receivers, and hogs blocking from the line all the way down the field. I'm telling you, I loved it. I, I love their scheme. But let, let me run through everything again. I'm going to get out of here, guys. Upcoming interviews tomorrow, Pete Shinnick, Townsend head coach. Later this week, Vincent Brown, North Carolina a t head coach. Clint Killew, UIW head coach, coming next week on for an interview on the show. South Dakota State, 45-21 win over North Dakota State in the 2023 National Championship. First national championship in school history. Mark Granowski had a hell of a game. Isaiah Davis and Johnson absolutely killed it in terms of running back. And, and the offensive line dominated the line of scrimmage. Caleb Sanders and Reese Winkleman did what they did. And Deshaun Gales had a great game at corner. Vincent Brown headed to North Carolina a t as head coach. Uh, we went through the schedule. I can see five to six wins for them. Tony Hull going to going to Grambling State as the OC. Love the hire. Was is going to be an elite recruiter in the state of Louisiana. Noah Washington to Morgan State, former Central Connecticut State linebacker. TJ Smith, former FAU quarterback to North Alabama. DJ DJ Boney from Easter Kentucky to FAMU. Zach Calzada, Texas A&M Auburn quarterback, headed to UIW. Daniel Britt, former Montana quarterback, headed to NAU. Key drain uh, Calligan to Jackson State from Louisiana Monroe with the DV spot. Kim Wimberly Delo- uh, to Delaware, former Harvard wide receiver. Big South Offensive Player of the Year, Jawan Fari headed to Eastern Illinois. UAPB running back Kayvon Britton headed to Tarleton State. And Campbell doing what they do. Antoine Sampa, a former five star outside linebacker for LSU. Deshaun Jerkins, a guy with almost 30 games of SEC experience. And Western Michigan defensive end Elijah Hawk is headed to Campbell, man. I appreciate y'all tuning in. I got a question here in the chat. Hang on. Um, so what was it about these two title teams that made them so good? What do HBCs need to do? Is it as simple as recruiting contentions and QB better? Uh, oh man, I I don't I don't think it's necessarily quarterback play. Like, I don't think Cam Miller. Is an elite core is an elite FCS quarterback. You know, Mark Mark Gronowski is legit. I think he's a little bit underrated in terms of his skill set. But I, I like neither t- both of these teams have been successful regardless of quarterback, especially North Dakota State. Line of scrimmage and trenches. I mean, the offensive lines for both of these teams are elite, and there are multiple guys who are going to go to the NFL from these offensive lines. The defensive line, particularly South Dakota State's interior, is elite. They had the best defensive tackle duo in the entire country. Reese Winkleman and Caleb Sanders are power five NFL prospects, in my opinion, that are just playing for South Dakota State. And really, man, there's really not a whole lot of difference. You know, the the linebackers for South Dakota State are legit. They got some monstrous linebackers that play really well in coverage and just hunt, man. Like like Kirby Smart said last night, they just go out and hunt. And due to the fact that the defensive line is so dominant for South Dakota State, it op- they take up so much space that the linebackers just get to come downhill untouched. And they just consistently make plays. I think the biggest difference from the elite FCS teams and the non-elite FCS teams is player development. I really do think that that plays more than anyone understands and wants to admit. When you look at when you look at the recruiting rankings year in and year out at the FCS level, there's a reason there are zero celebration bowl wins. There were I think one or two FCS conference titles and zero national titles in the school's history of any of the top 10 teams in the two, four, seven rankings. It, there's a reason stars like stars aren't winning at the FCS level. It's player development. When you look at a guy like Cody mock for North Dakota state, probably going to be a first round pick at offensive tackle. They've recruited a tight end who is two thirty. And he developed into a 6'6", 300-plus-pound mauler at offensive tackle that started almost 50 games in his in his career. They take guys like Nash Jensen, who developed into a guy that had 70 starts at left guard. 
it, Trevor Penning, I, I can just keep going. Like the list, the, the development is just next level. And also on top of that, they have people always overlook the, the aspect of what a culture really is inside a program. Once you establish a winning culture and you can keep that going from multiple throughout multiple head coaches as players come and go, the standard, the system, the culture doesn't change. That play, I know it sounds kind of abstract, but I mean, that is the difference. When you talk to North Dakota State players, man, like you could tell it's different. South Dakota State, too. Like the upper echelon of the FCS, they got amazing trench play. Their player development is just insane. And also on top of that, the consistency that these programs have. Like when you look at, at in the grand scheme of things, like I know North Dakota State got affected this year. And I kind of I guess it kind of showed in the national championship. These programs, these programs don't lose a lot in the transfer portal, and they don't they don't build their programs out of the transfer portal. The elite FCS programs build their programs through high school recruiting and development, JUCO recruiting and development, whatever you want to say. They're not going out and getting a bunch of P5 drop downs for the most part to be keep to, to you know build their entire team from P5 drop downs and go compete for a national title. When you look at like most of the star players, like there's a few examples but when you look at the star players in the national championship, there were not many transfers that were the main stars of that game. It was all guys who were developed in-house. Consistency, building a culture, getting players to buy in, player development, man, all those things are keys that I think really do kind of separate into tiers at the FCS level. And, man, you see it year in and year out, man. The same programs were there, and they all got the same type of makeup behind the scenes. If you don't build through high school, listen, getting a bunch of P5 drop downs is not how you win national championships for the most part. There's not many examples of that at the FCS level. And so you got to develop your talent that you get from the high school level. And the crazy part is a lot of the elite programs in the FCS level aren't in talent rich states. They're not recruiting kids from Florida who got all the stars and like, I mean, they're developing unranked kids into superstars at the FCS level. And that that is crazy. Uh, let's see. I, I'm going to get to. It's both. It's the coaching and the training. They got elite coaching staffs, and and they and they get great training. I, I I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, I'll to a point, but that's a lot harder. That's a lot easier said than done. D. I'll say that because no one could have done. No one did it. To either, to either one of the, I mean, South Dakota State went fourteen and zero at the FCS level. No one stopped them. Like you, like, and there wasn't anybody in the FCS that was going to. There was nobody in the FCS that that had a better run defense than South Dakota State, and there wasn't anyone in the FCS that was going to stop their rushing attack. That it's, I mean, they just had the best. They built their team to win the national title this year, and they went out and did it. Depends on what position you have those stars at. Yeah, but I mean, two and three star guys aren't necessarily getting you into into like the top. Like, because you don't see North Dakota State out because there's FCS programs that have landed four four stars and stuff like that. I mean, they're not getting high rated three star kids. I mean, they're not getting top one thousand kids. I mean, just go through the recruiting rank. I mean, they really don't. At the end of the day, I mean, they got some three star guys, but. There's a lot of three-star guys out there. And even two-star guys don't get you in the top 10 rankings of, of FCS recruiting rankings. But, yes, d- depending on the position matters as well because they they kind of build their team. They, they build their team to fit their system perfectly. They run the football, and they're going to be more physical than you, and that's where all their stars are. He said, don't blue, don't tell don't tell the secrets. Let them keep believing in star rankings. That is true for FBS as well. They build through high school. There are no professional sports teams in those states. It's all about them schools, all them kids going from uh, going to those schools from those states. That's fair. The group, that's how Georgia Southern App State teams have always done when they were FCS. They developed well. Man, that's still how App State's winning. App State isn't out here recruiting four stars, and App State's still winning. Coastal Carolina ain't out here getting four stars, and they're still winning. So it's all about player development. Transfer portal's a new thing. That's great for the Dakotas, but maybe some other teams might need it too. Yeah, I mean, you. I think what you hear from elite coaches is 
They recruit high school kids to build their program and then use the transfer portal to fill in the gaps that high school recruiting can't. Where, you know, maybe you have like a weird gap between your senior and your freshman you have it, and the freshman's not ready to play. You get a kind of a bridge kid to fill that in the transfer portal. Um, I do think you could flip a roster, like you said, in terms of transfers and, and, and improve your game. But I, I think long term, that's not that's probably not how you build a pro. I, I would say I, I wonder what the longevity of that would be. I mean, listen, I know what program everyone's thinking of in terms of transfer portal. What's the longevity of success that, you know, Jackson State would have had if if it would have went into like year five or six of just recruit, you know, recruiting that high level out of the transfer portal. I don't know. Campbell's doing it. They haven't necessarily seen the results on the field. So well, I, I'm interested to see what what's going to happen moving forward with Campbell with all these transfers coming in. Since the 70s set one has been stop the run, you give yourself a chance to win. Yeah, I mean, I'm with I'm I'm with you on that. You have to stop the run. It's just no one's been able to. But yeah, if you win the line of scrimmage. If you run the football, you control the time possession, you win the you win the turnover battle. And if you check off those four boxes, you win probably 90% of the time. At, at the end of the day, like if you control those four things, man, like you most you most of the time win the football game. It, it, it nothing's changed. Like, yes, all the all the stats and the flashy passing and, and everything has has kind of emerged in football, but at the end of the day, you still have to win like there's still there's still categories you have to win, and there's still areas in the game you have to play really well in. Man, that is such a long answer to that one, Sonic Boom. I, it, it just one, it starts with strength and conditioning. Two, it starts with consistency in the program where you don't have a lot of turnover year in and year out. You, you like your guys have that like kind of bond. You have some consistency year in and year out. You're not replacing 16 starters every season. Like, it, I think that's kind of what it's like. You, have players from the time they're freshmen till they're seniors. And that's that's what you're seeing at North Dakota State. Like players aren't just transferring out for the most part. Hunter Lippy could have went FBS. Cody Mott could have went SBS. Nash Jensen. Um who else? Michael Tutsi. Um who else you want to throw in there? Um I mean hell I mean th there's been a few players to transfer out but for the most part they are so consistent with what they're bringing back year in and year out. And it's strength and conditioning and it's just making sure your players buy into the system. It's just, it's just such a tricky question to answer, Sonic Boom. Because once, once again, I don't necessarily know the behind the scenes of every FCS program that's not winning. So it's just, I would say, start with strength and conditioning and just consistency of what's in your program and and getting people to buy into what you're doing at that program would be the two first things. Great show once again, Blue. Please have another show all about the transfer portal. Hey, I'm definitely going to keep, um, I guess, gonna keep updating you. And yeah, I'm with, I'm with D here. Assistant coaches are so important; they're so overlooked. Everyone talks about the OC, DC head coach. Your assistant coaches are your lead recruiters. You're like your positional coaches are lead recruiters, and they also help develop the program. Like your assistant, your assistant coaches are. Like I said earlier, the life like they're the lifeline to to a successful program. And also with North Dakota State, they've had different head coaches, but a lot of their assistants have been consistent staying inside that program and building what's there. Um, you know, I I, I can't really tell you, T. I, I don't that well at first, I think they've only really recruited at this level for three seasons now. Like this is a must-win year. If they don't win this year, a lot of people are gonna be looking sideways. This they haven't always been recruiting like this. It's just been recently when Mentor brought in some new additions to his staff. So I think it's gonna come down to whether they win this year, and it's gonna be really hard year one of the CAA. Long term, you do have to develop guys, but in the short term, some teams always um some teams that have always been at the bottom can at least give you a jump start. That's true. I'm like, and there are some teams. Uh, that's what Campbell's trying to do. They were not very good for a long time. They were they didn't have any scholarships, etc. And they went to the transfer portal to try to boost the boost the roster. And we'll see how it works. And now, now they've also started recruiting some high school kids too. That's why Campbell landed what 15, 16, three stars, and Miles Rouser's a four star. And we'll see how it works. Um. We'll see how it works long term. But, guys, man, I'm about to get out of here. I appreciate you guys tuning in. Hit the like button on your way out. And I'm also – I'll be coming back with some more content later this week. 
Pete Shinnick interview dropping tomorrow. I'll probably do another live stream toward the end of the week. The roundtable should be on Thursday. But guys, until next time, the Blue Bloods are out. Mm-hmm.